Today on Day One Outdoors. Anchor fishing is an effective way to target salmon and steelhead as they migrate upstream to their spawning grounds. However, with changing water conditions and crowded rivers, anchor fishing can be intimidating. During this one hour special, we will discuss the proper equipment, locations, safety, and techniques to be successful on the hook. Right now, on Day One Outdoors. The forecast showers and thunderstorms today with strong southwesterly winds to 37 miles per hour. It's a numbers game, especially for the situation that we're in. We're coming off of a high water event here. The outdoors is not a hobby. It's not our passion. It is our way of life. We make the perfect cast, slow our breathing to execute a perfect shot, spend hours researching locations and techniques. Regardless of effort, we fail. This series is not about incredible bites or trophy animals. Our goal here at Day One Outdoors is to educate our viewers, utilizing new technology to offer a different perspective. Watch as we research new areas, plan out the day, and adjust to changing conditions. If not for other experienced outdoorsmen teaching me along the way, I wouldn't have this life. I owe it to them to pass this knowledge along. I owe it to you. Join us here on Day One Outdoors, and let's learn how to become more successful in the field and on the water from day one. We've arrived here at the ramp, and now it's time to get the sled ready for launch. During high season, these boat ramps can become very hectic because of the crowds. So you wanna make sure that you know exactly your routine on how to get your boat ready. The first step I always take is putting in the plug. This is the most important piece you could have in your boat. You don't want it to take on any water. So we put the plug into the back, twist it tight. Make sure it's in there good and snug, not gonna come out. Next, I'm popping off the two back straps off the port and starboard side. There's the first one and the starboard strap. Next, I'm turning on the battery selector and removing the motor brackets. Now, if you have two people in the boat, you can easily put one person at the helm and one person driving the truck. But considering that it's just me out here putting the boat in, I'm going to leave my bow straps attached. I'm not going to unhook these until the boat is actually in the water and I do that for safety. I want to make sure that the boat is attached firmly to the trailer until it's floating on the water. The boat's all ready, so let's go dump it in the water. We just pulled up to the front and now we're next in line. Now it's time for me to choose lane. Whenever I'm trying to choose a lane to back the boat down, I always try and find one where I'm going to have the dock on my left hand side. The reason why is because it makes it easier for me to pay attention to where my trailer tires are by using my driver's side view mirror. So it looks like I got the second lane wide open, so I'm gonna pull up and start getting the trailer all straightened out, ready to be back down. We've just straightened out the trailer and now we're ready to back down. First, turn off your lights. Early in the morning when it's dark out, having your headlights on can blind other people that are trying to back their trailers down. The easiest way to back down your trailer is to take your right hand, put it at the bottom of the steering wheel. If you want the trailer to go right, move your hand to the right. If you want the trailer to go left, just move your hand to the left. Truck's in reverse, trailer is starting to drift left, so I'm gonna move my hand to the right. Brings the trailer around to the right, get it straightened up. Again, even with this dock on my left hand side, makes it very easy to back down by using my side view mirror. And as soon as the trailer tires start to go down the slope of the ramp, I put it into neutral. That way the brakes aren't working as hard. Trailer a little bit more to the left and to the left. Now the boat is getting close to the water here. And for most trailers, if you get the wheel well underwater, that should give the boat enough water underneath it to float the boat. So I'm gonna get just the top of the wheel well underwater. There it goes, perfect. 
park, parking brake, boat's in the water. So now it's time to unhook the bow straps. Safety chain first. Now the bow strap. And again, I wait to unhook the bow straps until the boat is in the water to make sure that the boat will not slip off the trailer. Now we're going to head back here to the motor, trim it down, and get it warming up. While it's warming up, I'm going to get my mooring lines ready, get the bumpers off to the side, and get the lines out. My lines are all ready, motor's warmed up, time to throw the boat into reverse, back off the trailer, and get us attached to the dock, and clear the ramp for the next boats coming in. We always want to try and get as far down the dock as possible. That way it frees up more room for the other boats that are going to be coming in and behind us. We get our stern line on first and now onto our bow line. The boat's all tied up, ready to go. So now I'm going to head back to the truck, grab it, park it, boat is secure and we're out of the way. Fishfield is your one-stop shop online for the gear you need here in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. From salmon and steelhead, saltwater, trout and kokanee, even crabbing. Visit fishfield.com today to place an order with no sales tax and have the gear you need shipped fast. Fishfield.com, we have what the Northwest Outdoorsman needs. Every once in a while, a new lure comes along that catches every angler's attention. It could be because of all the irresistible colors and finishes, or the patented skip beat action, or maybe it's the wide variety of sizes designed for salmon, trout, walleye, steelhead, mackinac, and more. But just for the record, we know one thing for certain. We didn't design the maglip to catch fishermen. Yakima Bait Company. We're just pulling out of the dock right now and it's time to go find the location where we're going to anchor. Now, anchor fishing is a numbers game. We're looking for ambush points. What are ambush points? It could be anything from piling rows to tips of islands, rock points jutting out, any place that we can find where it might condense the fish. And that could even be choke points in the river where the river narrows. So what we're going to do is we're going to go out and explain each one of these types of structures and explain why these fish will hold and associate to this type of cover. So let's head on out here and get to our first one. We're pulling up on our first type of structure right now, and this is a man-made structure called a piling row. The design for these pilings is to divert the flow of water. They try and do it to keep the river in a specific channel. Now what this also does is it concentrates the fish. These salmon can absolutely swim through the pilings, but more times than not, it creates a boil in behind it the fish will slow down, find a gap where they can either shoot through or come all the way out around the tip. So on a pilot row such as this, there's big boils in behind it. It's not gonna be the best to tie off to the pilings because you don't have consistent current to give your gear action. So on a piling row such as this, we're probably gonna wanna anchor up to the outside, just out here off this edge where that current speeds up and we can get consistent action out of our gear. So in some cases, you can tie off to the pilings themselves if there's enough water flowing through during high water situations. Or right now, since we're at normal flows, coming off the edges of them and fishing off the points of these piling rows is gonna be your best bet. Now we're pulling up on some underwater structure that we call a hump. And these humps can be great spots to anchor up and target salmon but there are a couple subtle nuances that we need to understand when fishing this structure. So right now I'm on the back side of the hump on the downstream side, and it's the deeper water. We're back here in 28, 30 feet of water. And as I continue to go upstream, we're gonna see it come up into about 23, 22 feet of water. 
When we're anchoring on these humps, we want to make sure we are not anchoring directly on top of them. We want the boat upstream of the hump. The reason why is because we want our gear on the shallowest part of that structure. If your gear is on the back side of it, you're getting less current and you're not getting the best action out of your lures. Also, when these fish are coming up on top of these humps, they bite better. If you're targeting them in the deeper holes like this 30 foot in behind this hump, they're not gonna bite as well as when they come up on top. When they come up on top, these fish are moving and are active. An active fish is an aggressive fish, is a biter. So make sure that your gear is up on top of the hump when you set up on it. So when anchoring, find the spot, create a GPS waypoint or a visual idea of where it is, get well upstream of it, and then drop your anchor to make sure that when your gear is out, it's sitting on top of that ridge. The next area that we're gonna consider is the bottom end of an island, which is a great place to target Spring Chinook. Fishing the bottom end of an island will give you two options. During normal flows, you wanna be on the main channel side of the island. You're gonna get more current. During higher flows, you can go to the back side of the island where it's gonna get more normalized flows and more fish will concentrate out of the main channel. So what you can see here off to my side right now is the bottom end of this island. And I'm only in about two feet of water right here and it drops off immediately from two feet down into the main channel. So we're getting more current off the main channel side right now because we're in normal flows. So if we were fishing here today, we'd be fishing on the south side of this island on the channel side. During higher flows, maybe a little bit later in April and May, we can fish on this inside over here because it's gonna get more current and the fish will concentrate to the softer edges. When fishing the bottom ends of islands, terraces, humps, regardless of where you are, these fish are what is called optometric. They will always be following some sort of structure, be it a current seam, a ridge line, a terrace, or a hump. A bottom ends of islands like this will have drop-offs on either side. These are great places for these fish to follow along that steep drop-off edge and continue their trek back up to the spawning grounds. This next spot that we're pulling up on right now is a point. And whether it's out of rock or a sand point, they're great locations to target springers. The reason why is because it concentrates the fish. What we have here on the inside of this point is dead water. It's all slack, it's a back eddy. I'm right now going straight up the current seam where these fish can be traveling. Over here on my left, the current's a lot faster. So this point that we're coming up on here right now is gonna concentrate the fish, push all the fish that were up against the bank back out towards this seam and the main point right here. Now when you come up on these points, you can see where they stick out and enter the water but you must also understand that they're going to continue down into the water itself. And looking at my depth finder right now, I can see that the point directly to my right is extending out right here, going all the way out into the river bottom itself. So when you're anchoring on these spots, just like fishing the humps, you wanna make sure you anchor upstream of them and then back your gear back out on top of that ridge. Cause that is where the fish are going to come up on top, get active and where you're gonna find your biters. Along a lot of these larger river systems, like the Columbia or the Willamette, we get these sand beaches. And when you have smaller particles of material along the bed, it creates terraces down in the water column. And these terraces can be from six to 10 feet, then it drops down. Your next bench can be eight to 15 feet, then 20 to 30 feet, and then down on into the main channel. And these terraces, these benches that are created are awesome travel lanes that these fish will follow. So what you wanna do is find where these terraces are. Now, the higher the water, the closer to the shore that you wanna be, that six to 10 foot range. The lower the water, the more normal flows or even low clear flows during years that we don't get as much rain or snow melt, you can come out here into that 18, 25, 30 foot range. But when you're setting up on them, you wanna make sure that you are fishing on the actual bench itself. So right off the edge where it drops off and then on that terrace or down the next bench onto that terrace. So fish right up one side of the boat on the bottom end of the drop off with your gear fishing right on that flat. This last spot we're gonna talk about for anchoring up for Spring Chinook is a flat. Now these flats are not ideal for anchoring and the reason why is because the fish can spread out. What I have behind me here is just a big uniform depth flat, all 18 to 22 feet of water. And you'll see a lot of boats anchor up. Lots of hog lines will appear on these flats and they can be productive, but only when the water temps are up, say 48, 50 degrees or higher. The reason why is because when those water temps are up, 
the fish will cover a lot of ground quickly. So on these flats, the fish will jump up, they'll be covering a lot of ground, and you can have good days, but only in those certain situations. So these flats like this are last on my list for anchoring, but if it's the last resort, you can still catch fish on them. Salmon swim up to 3,000 miles to return to their exact place of birth to reproduce. Well, most of the time. There are several different styles of anchors out there on the market, and we're going to talk about the ones that work best here in the Pacific Northwest. There's a sand anchor, a stockless, or even a Danforth style anchor. But for the most part, here in the Northwest, we're using what's called a Columbia River anchor. The Columbia River anchor is recognizable by its single arm coming down into a T, and then either one or two tines on its bottom bar. This Columbia River style anchor is perfect for the style of bottom that we have out here in most of our rivers. It will grab that sand and small rock really well, even with a short amount of rope. So first, we need chain. And the reason why we need chain is because it's gonna help keep this top arm down close to the bottom so the tines can grab the sand or small rock that's in the bottom of the river. Typically, you want at least a minimum of six feet of chain. From the chain, we go to our rope. Rope, you're gonna want either a 3 8 inch up to a half inch size. And for the amount of length, usually about 300 feet should be good. Our rope, we're gonna keep it in a rope bag. This is a great way to store it. It's aerated so that way the water will fall through and keep your rope from rotting. And then out the back end, we have a short lead line of rope out to a bumper or a buoy ball. And this is what's gonna float on top of the water when we release, either to go get a fish or just run to shore real quick. The last piece of our equipment for our anchor setup is actually probably one of the most important. It's our anchor ball. This is what is going to keep us in place on the spot and also take a lot of tension off of the anchor itself to make sure that the anchor doesn't slip. What this also does is helps us bring up this big 45, 50 pound anchor without breaking our backs. So what we do is we attach it to the rope. And most anchor systems will actually already have this attached to the rope in line. This design here is one that I can easily clip on and off. So I'm gonna throw this on here. There, it's all set. So now this is in line. Now this is a jam cleat, so it will only slide one direction, and that is towards the anchor. And the reason why is when we're picking up our anchor, we run the boat upstream of the anchor itself, and the buoy will slide down the anchor rope all the way down to the chain and lift our anchor off the bottom. When we let the anchor loose off the bow, it will go down and hit the bottom. Now when it hits bottom, it'll be standing straight up, just like what we see here. As the boat pulls away from the anchor, the weight of the anchor chain will pull the anchor down, and the more rope we let out, the shallower the angle. Now that's really important. The amount of rope that we want to let out is roughly about six times the depth of water that we're in. So if we're in 10 feet of water, we want to use about 60 feet of rope. Now this is different. We can use less rope if we're in slower current. We might need more rope if we're in faster current. The reason why? is because the shallower the angle, the better the anchor tines will dig into the dirt. If I am sitting with a short scope, not much rope, it's going to try and pull the anchor up and out of the dirt. If we use a lot of rope, the anchor rope angle becomes shallower and digs the anchor in stronger. As a general rule, try and use more rope as opposed to less. Right now what we're gonna do is pull up on this piling row and there's a gap right in between the pilings. 
and we see a red buoy and a green buoy. And what we're going to do is use that as a way to mimic pulling up into a hog line and finding a gap in between two boats. Now hog line fishing can be very fun, it's very social, but sometimes people can get a little bit frustrated with uh, other anglers trying to get in a little bit too close. So the best thing to do is pull up in between the two boats starting from way downstream and very slowly come up in between them and talk to each one. Talk to boats on either side and ask them if it's okay if you anchor up right there. If they're fishing six rods in each boat and it's a tight spot, you may try and find some other place to anchor. Again, these fish are finding travel lanes, so you don't necessarily need to be right next to the boat that's catching fish. Sometimes you can be upstream or downstream of those boats and have just as much success. So we're pulling up in between the red and green buoy right now. It's time to understand what the current is doing and get our anchor all set. One thing to keep in mind is that if we use a lot of anchor rope, let's say 100 feet and only 10 feet of water, that will allow the boat to swing a lot, port and starboard, which is not good, especially in areas where the current is constantly boiling or on windy days. So we wanna use just enough anchor rope to make sure that we aren't sliding downstream. Right here, I'm in about eight, nine feet of water in between that gap. So I'm gonna try and keep about 50 to 75 feet of rope. Again, if I used 100, 150, the boat would be swinging all over the place. So don't use too much rope. What we're gonna do here to get the anchor ready to drop is just slowly put over the front so the chain is all the way down over the bow. Then I'm gonna take this rope and place it into the teeth right here. What I'm doing now is trying to read the current. I look to my left, look to my right, and I take a few moments to understand how the water is moving. We don't wanna just go up above the boats, look back, drop the anchor, and expect it to work out. So we come upstream just a little ways, about the same distance that we actually wanna drop the anchor. Look at the current and it looks like I have a little cross current coming from left to right. So what I'm gonna do is position the boat a little bit to the right of my starboard boat and slide in place here. Once I'm lined up in the current where I see the current edge is going right to the exact same spot that I want the boat to be sitting, at that point, I'll pull on the anchor, pull it out of that jam cleat and drop the anchor down to the bottom. So let's get ourselves lined up here. Anchor just hit the bottom. And the one thing that you do not want to do is throw the boat in reverse and gun it backwards. We want a controlled descent. So we just put the boat in neutral and let the current do the work for us. So I'm gonna walk up to the front here and allow the current to pull us back in between these two buoys that we are using to mimic the hog line. Slowly letting rope out. And the reason why we do this slowly is because if we drop the anchor a little bit too far left or right, we can stop, put the rope back in the jam cleat, pull the anchor up, and try again. We want to come into the hog line nice, slow, and easy. Looking good so far. There we are. Slow the descent. Drop it in the cleats. Now I'm just gonna sit here and see how the boat settles. It's already starting to pull me over here to the starboard side. It might be getting me a little bit too close to this boat. So let's see how it sets. Boat is looking pretty well squared up. So you want the buoy to be about 15, 20 feet above the boat, upstream of the boat. The reason why is because this will act as a pivot point for us when we're trying to line up the back of the boat left or right with the boats next to us. So let's get it down. There we go. Let's go ahead and send it over to the side. Our anchor is set right now and it looks like I'm way too close to what we're using as our boat over here to this red buoy. I've gotten too close to him, so now we need to talk about how to shift the boat over. The first is by using the motors themselves. So I'm gonna drop my kicker motor in the water and by using the kicker motor as well as your main motor, if it's a prop, you have two rudders. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them both into reverse what that does is it locks the prop into place and creates drag. Now I wanna move the back of the boat away from this boat over here to my right. So I'm gonna push the motors so that the rudders will create that drag and pull me away. And you can see it's slowly starting to pull me away here from this red buoy over here to my right. 
We've kicked our motors over to swing the back of the boat away from our neighbor over here, but now we need to get the bow of the boat away from him as well. Square the boat up so our lines can fish straight. So what we're gonna do is use these bow chocks. These are a great tool for us when we're anchoring. So I wanna move the bow over to the left towards the port. So I'm gonna take the rope, I'm gonna put it on one of these chocks over here on the right hand side. That will change the angle going down to the anchor rope and swing the boat over to the left. So I'll put it here on the second one, put it back in place. See how the bow of the boat is starting to swing over to the side? Not quite far enough yet. So let's bring it over a couple more. Bring it all the way over here to this far one. There we go. Let's see how the boat lines up now. Starting to come around. Bow's coming over. Looking pretty good. So let's head on back to the back of the boat and check the distance between our two neighbors here. We're looking pretty squared up and centered right here in the hole, but we're gonna talk about another tool that everybody should have while anchoring. It's a drift sock. Using a drift sock can be very helpful when the wind is gusting or as the currents change. So this drift sock, what it's designed to do, is just create drag. So we're gonna put it in the water here, and it's gonna grab the current, grab the water, and help keep the back of the boat straight. So let's put it in the water, starts grabbing current. Drift sock is now full of water, creating drag. Take this little clip here and attach it to the back eyelet on the back of my boat. Just like that. Now we wanna make sure that the boat is balanced. We don't wanna to have too much drag on one side or the other. So having two will ensure that your boat remains straight. Now we have two drift socks out, creating equal pressure, pulling us tight to our anchor rope. And it looks like we're sitting perfectly centered. Now, if we need to adjust left to right as currents change, the tide changes, or as the wind picks up, we can just use our motors or the bow chocks. The boat squared up in the hole, so now let's get our anchor rope bag ready for the release for when we hook a fish. So I'm gonna take up all the excess rope, put it in the bag, seal it up good and tight. Then with this cord here coming off the rope bag, I'm gonna tie just a couple of quick half hitches around the main rope. And what this does is ensures that no rope comes out of the bag. Because when we hook a fish, the first thing we wanna do is get away from all these other boats. So you hook up, pull back on the teeth, toss the rope in the bag in the buoy, and float away from all the other boats. Anchoring in the Columbia River can be a bit dangerous. We get a lot of change in the flow from the dams, and also sometimes we get big trees and logs that come downstream. So I always keep a knife up here at the bow for if I see an obstruction coming downstream, I can quickly grab the knife and cut the anchor rope. Now the knife that I have up front here is serrated. That's gonna allow me to cut through the rope quickly. We've covered the basics on how to locate fish when trying to anchor. We've also covered the basics of anchoring. We're all set up, so we're gonna pack up and get all of our gear ready for tomorrow. We'll see you out there. Fishfield is your one-stop shop online for the gear you need here in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. From salmon and steelhead, saltwater, trout and kokanee, even crabbing. Visit fishfield.com today to place an order with no sales tax and have the gear you need shipped fast. Fishfield.com, we have what the Northwest Outdoorsman needs. Every once in a while, a new lure comes along that catches every angler's attention. It could be because of all the irresistible colors and finishes, or the patented skip beat action, or maybe it's the wide variety of sizes designed for salmon, trout, walleye, steelhead, mackinac, and more. But just for the record, we know one thing for certain. We didn't design the maglip to catch fishermen. Yakima Bait Company.
Jason Hamley and Ryan Queen joined us on the boat for their knowledge and for a few extra lines in the water. The three of us have fished together and been friends for over 15 years. When sitting on anchor, it's always nice having good company aboard. We're getting our day started and a little bit later on in the morning of what we typically do, it's about eight o'clock and that's because of our tides today. The tide doesn't start running till about nine o'clock, which gives us an hour to figure out where we're gonna anchor. Now we decided to come downstream quite a ways here towards the lower Columbia out of uh, Gobo, Klamath, Klamath area. The reason why is because anchor fishing is a numbers game. The more fish you get in front of, the more fish that are traveling past you, the better your chances are. So right down here, we have the Willamette fish that are coming up into uh, the Willamette and its tributary, so about 70,000 fish. Then we also have the Lewis, Klamath, Cowlitz fish that are all gonna be in this area. So it just increases our odds on top of the upriver spring chinook that are expected to cross over Bonneville this year. So what we're gonna do right now is go around and look for the structures that we talked about earlier looking for our humps, our terraces, our piling rows, look for our flats, and just do a little bit of scouting here before the tide starts running in about an hour at 9 a.m. So we're gonna look at Google Earth a little bit on our phones, take a look at the surrounding areas, look at other anglers, see what type of structure they're anchored up on, because locals obviously know better than we do. Here's looking a lot better. We're in about 18 feet. We got two spots right now that are piquing our interest. This one off this rock point creates a really nice current seam. There's a hump in behind it. I like that, but to your point, it'd be nice to be around some other bo boats too. So there's three of us. Jason's tiebreaker. I like, like that idea. Start up higher. Start up higher that other spot around yep. other boats. Pulling up on the spot that Jason and Ryan that we should run up to and take a look at. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of create a map. There's four or five boats up here now, and they're all seem to be fishing about 20, 25 feet or deeper. So I'm gonna try and fish inside of them because those guys are already covering that water. And if they start getting bit, we'll know that the fish are out there in a little bit deeper water, but we might as well fish a different travel lane. So what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna anchor upstream about 100 yards, but I'm gonna start downstream here and create a zigzag. I'm trying to graph down here and get an idea of the lay of the land down below the water surface. So get an idea of if there's any humps, any uh, ridges or terraces, and then get the boat lined up. And that way we'll also know exactly how far to put our lines out behind the boat. I like inside. If they're whooping on them out there, it doesn't take but two seconds to pull up and go out that far, you know, farther out. All right, bud. Line me up. All right, RQ, you can kill it. We're setting up just right on time here. The tide's barely starting to move. Just getting going. Good timing. Hey, oh, fish hey. on. Oh, it came off. That's a good sign. Just, just drop the anchor in and boat outside of it's just hooked up. Hopefully we're not too far inside, but we're gonna find out. We're getting all of our gear set up right now and Jason has an M2 size flatfish out. Ryan is tying up a T50. I'm gonna put on a T4, a little bit smaller size plug and trying different wraps, different scents, different distances behind the boat, different dropper lengths and giving the fish different looks here until we figure out a pattern, see what boats are catching fish what gear that we're using here starts to catch fish and we'll really start to dial in that pattern. I'm getting our sardines ready for our plug wraps. I'm gonna show you exactly what I do here. I start out by filleting our sardine. I just now thawed out enough where I can cut through the meat. I'm gonna flay it out just like a salmon. all the way across. So now I've got the flay off the sardine here. And now we need to trim it up because we've got a lot of the intrals in there and a bunch of excess hanging out along the side. We want to make sure that the wrap is as even as possible to keep the balance of the plug right. So I'm going to trim up each side. A little bit 
on the rounded edge of the back. Again, trying to make it as even all the way across. Trim the tail up. What we end up with here, the perfect size fillet. So I'm going to lead the fillet that long, the entire length of the sardine itself. And the reason why is because we're using different size plugs. We're running anywhere from a T4 up to a size T50. So having one single length sardine fillet allows me to cut it to the length of the plug that we're using. I always carry a little tub. I start out with just rock salt. Just put a handful of rock salt. And then I lay the sardine fillet skin side down onto the rock salt. Just like that. And I'll lay them all in there. So that way they're all skin side down. Because next what I do is I take a little bit of this slamola powder. And they also make it in garlic as well. So when the water temps warm up, I tend to use a little bit more garlic. But for now, water temp's fairly cold, 46 degrees. So I'm going to use just the normal slamola. Just very lightly sprinkle it on top of the filet. Then I'm going to also put a little bit of monster bite on there. Just a little tiny bit of monster bite. There we go. You can also add like a bloody tuna powder or a krill powder, but I always start with that for my base. And then from there I can add scents to it, some gels or oils. I can add the bloody tuna or the krill powders, but that is my base. So it's very, very simple. But once we got it in here into the tub with the rock salt down to toughen up the skin side, a little bit of that monster bite and slamola on top of the bait itself, toughen it up just a touch. It helps make it last and keep your gear fishing for longer. Keep that oil slick going behind the bait. Most time on anchor, you're fishing plugs. And what I'm gonna do is right now get ready to fish a flatline megalit 4.5. We're only in 15, 16 feet of water and these will easily dive to that depth. And what I like about flatlining them is that they'll actually be back there hunting. They're gonna be swinging left, swinging right with the boat. They're covering a lot more water than when you put it just a regular T50 down on a dropper. But we need to first get the plug ready. So I'm gonna start by getting it wet. Take my scrub brush here that already has soap on it. Clean the plug up. Rinse her off. You can see this one might have caught a fish or two. It's one of my favorite ones, this payday color. What's great about these mag lips is that they have little notch marks on the sides. And that is going to help you determine exactly where to put your wrap. It's a guide. So you want to keep your wrap between this front notch mark right in front of the eye and this back notch mark, which is about an inch behind your center eye. If you put it too far forward, the plug won't run right. Too far back, you're going to kill the action. We're going to put most of our wrap just right here around the center eyelet, which is the plug's pivot point. Scoop some up here. Go on the front as well. And it looks like it is about centered. And I don't put too much of a wrap onto these mag lips, especially when I'm flatlining, because I want them to have as much action as possible. If you put too much on there, you're going to slow the action. And right now, we're at the beginning of the tide. So I want that current to be grabbing as much of this lure as possible. Just enough on there to give a little bit of scent. Start with my stretchy thread here. Pinch the tag in down with my thumb. And then just start slowly wrapping it on. Just like so. The back half all wrapped on there. Throw the hook to the other side. Center up the wrap. So what I'm doing, I'm just trying to make sure nothing comes out there. So now it's all pinched on good and tight. Now I'm going to take my index finger here, put it right on top of the plug, go over top. We're creating a half pitch. Now I take the stretchy thread tube, put it underneath that loop, pull it tight, and I do that twice. Locks it in place. Stretchy thread will break. Now it's on there. And you can see this always happens whether it's with tuna, this mix here, or with a sardine wrap. Anytime you wrap it, it always pulls the wrap a little bit off center. Again, we want that plug perfectly balanced. So we need to push the wrap back towards the middle here. Make sure all centered up. Now it's looking good. Again, between the notch marks, right in the middle of the plug on its pivot point. Now we're going to put it in the water and make sure that it's still swimming straight. Good size, yeah. Plug is running a little bit towards the boat, a little bit to the right, so I'm checking the, the pull point for first, which is the front eyelet right here. These mag lips are already pre-tuned, so you don't want to twist them too much. But what you do want to do is make sure that the back 
eyelet here, back hook eyelet, is perfectly in line with the front eyelet. Same with the belly hook too. Make sure everything is perfectly lined up. And it looks like the back one is good. Front might be off just a touch. Just try and just a touch. Barely, ever so barely. Oh, that's encouraging. <laughs> so the bite down here has been kind of slow, so Cody's on the line with uh, Buddy up, up yeah, river 72. here, so we're gonna see if the bite's a little better up there and we might make some tracks. <laughs> Watch five fish in the last 30 minutes and the boat below him just doubled up. Real love. <laughs> Sometimes it's really nice having good friends. We had one bite here. I really like the way the spot looks, but we were at the tide change. Should have had a few fish bite. We just didn't. We only saw maybe one or two other rips. A couple buddies are up river and they're they're finding fish. Sounds like there's a really big wad of them. So time to move. Salmon swim up to 3,000 miles to return to their exact place of birth to reproduce. Well, most of the time. having good friends out here on the water helping you look and it sounded like there's a big water fish now on big tide exchanges like what we're having right now we get shots of fish that come up and when we find these shots of fish you always try and stay in front of them so even though our thought process was correct in heading downstream to get in front of as many fish as possible it sounds like the big water fish was about six or seven miles upstream so man, all the way up here hopefully it pays off well, it's just a big flat here, right? Good. Yeah, you can go ahead and toss them. We always hear about the importance of dropper length, but we also need to consider how far behind the boat our line is, because that will actually dictate how far off the bottom our gear is. Anytime we put our line further out behind the boat, our dropper length becomes shorter. We're gonna go back to high school geometry class right now. If you guys recall the Pythagorean theorem, the sides of a triangle, the farther back you put your line, the shallower your dropper length becomes. So if we have, let's say a six foot dropper length and we put it back there so far that we're at a 45 degree angle. That six foot dropper just became a three foot dropper. It cut that distance in half. So knowing not only the dropper length that you're getting bit at, but how far behind the boat you are is very, very important. This is the joys of anchor fishing. There's nothing really for us to do but sit here and wait. We got a spinner over here on our starboard side that just got bit and the fish didn't stick. We got an anchovy over here on the port, and then the two corners are running T50s off a of dropper. So we're, we're covering the entire spectrum for gear that we can be using. But what we're trying to do now is change up our distances behind the boat. So we got uh, the two T50s out at uh, 70 and 100 feet. Then these two rods here are short at about 30 feet and 50 feet. So we're trying to cover this shelf and figure out exactly where they're traveling. And our first bite on that spinner did come on the short rod at 30 feet. So now all we got to do is just keep on adjusting our distances behind the boat, which again changes our dropper length. The further we put it out, the shorter that dropper length becomes and gets our gear closer to the bottom. So instead of changing our dropper lengths from 12 inches to 24 inches to 36 inches, you can just 
put it out different distances behind the boat. And we're just going to keep on sitting here, waiting around, enjoying talking with the boats around us, and see if we can't figure out what these fish are biting on. So far, Spinner has one grab. Putting on a big wrap to slow it down. We're getting a fresh wrap all done here right now. We're, we know we're in a decent spot. There's been fish caught around us. We missed a bite. So the key thing here is to constantly keep fresh bait down there. We're trying to keep a really good scent slick down there. So we're putting down lots of different flavors of pro here from the salmon slammer to the bloody tuna, mixing it up. We're running the sardine here on this one, just straight up with the monster bite and a little bit of that slamola on it. Just keep mixing it up and trying different things, different distances behind the boat to try and get different angles and even different size wraps on here. I put a bigger one on to try and slow down the action of the plug since we're getting towards the middle of the tide. Let's see if that works. It's been a bit of a struggle for us today. We've had a few grabs, but nothing that's really stuck yet. We're gonna check these two rigs here and freshen them up before we get them back out there. We're coming up on the next tide chain, so hopefully we'll get a snap or two when that occurs. But we're gonna go through this rig here real quick. So this is one of the setups that we had our bite on here. Started out with the rod. This is just the Lama Glass Canine Quick Series, and it's the 885. It's an eight foot eight five power, which I really like for running spinners. It's not too short, so it gets it out there behind the back of the boat, and uh, you can soft enough in the tip that you can actually see the spinner blade working as well. We're just using a 300 size reel here with 65 pound Maxima Braid 8. It's in high vis. I like using the high vis so I can see exactly where the line goes into the water. Keeps our line separated. Down to our terminal tackle. Just a T bead here to grab the grass. The water's starting to warm up, so the grass is starting to come down through the water. And then from the T bead, just a couple of clear stacker beads create some separation between the slider and the bead chain swivel right there. Then out to a snap, and I just use a snap for a quick change on my lures. And then I'm running 30 pound ultra green here. And these fish, they're coming up from behind the lure, whether it's the plug or the spinner in this case. And they could really care less what pound test you're running. We're using big plugs, big lures. And so for the most part, it's not gonna matter what pound test. It won't affect the action of your lure. Down here, this is just a little spinner that I've tied up. It's a silver number four Indiana blade Hildebrand spinner with red beads. Then one single dark red facet bead in the middle. This is the one, again, that we had a bite on earlier. So Ryan's rod here, what we have set up is again the quick series from Lamb Glass. This one's the 934, nine foot three, four power. And I like these lighter rods because you can see they're very parabolic in their bend. And that allows the lure, the plug, to work effortlessly. It gets the most action out of the lure that we can. Plus it has enough power when the rod does lock down when the fish bites to drive that hook home. And then on this, we actually have a line counter reel. We talked about the importance of having the exact distance behind the boat. Make sure that you know where you are on the terrace or the bench or the hump in behind uh, your boat. So it is important to have a line counter reel. With our line right here, this is actually 40 pound Maxima high vis yellow. Again, I like the high vis line so I can see exactly where that line enters into the water. So that way I can make sure our gear is separated. From there, down to our terminal, exactly the same as the other setup. We have the black T-bead, slider, a couple stacker beads, down to a snap right here, down to our swivel for a quick change. 30 pound ultra green once again. But what's different about these setups here with the plugs is we run a really long leader and a short dropper. So we're actually running a six foot long leader here of 30 pound ultra green. And we use a longer leader to allow the plugs to get the most amount of action possible. Now, Yakima Bay Company makes two different styles of plugs, and there are what I call the flat running plugs, like the M2s and T50s, and then the divers, like the Maglips here, this 4.5 or the Maglip 5.0. Typically, when I'm running a dropper line, like on this setup here on Ryan's rod, I like to run the flat divers, be it a U20, T4, M2, or T50, because they run flat in the water column. So you're gonna get most amount of wide wiggle, wide action that you possibly can. If I run one of these diving plugs, like a Megalit 4.5, it's gonna run nose down, and it's gonna be digging in the dirt the whole time. So you absolutely can run a Megalit off of a dropper line. However, on Ryan's rod right now, we have about a two foot dropper, which is perfect for the T50. 
But if I were to run this maglip, I would shorten up my leader and lengthen my dropper line. I would run probably a five by five, five foot dropper and five foot leader. That way it keeps this plug up off the bottom and allows it to have that skip bead action. So be mindful of the plug that you're putting down in the water column. If it's a diver, make a little bit longer dropper or just flatline it. If it's a T50, M2, U20, T4, one of the flat running plugs that wiggles wide side to side, you can get away with a shorter dropper, like in this case here, this two foot dropper. You want the reality of what's going on today? We planned this out a couple weeks in advance. The trolling boats are catching around us. We're trying to do an anchoring show, and it's very frustrating when you know there's fish being caught around you, and we could be catching, but we're trying to do a show on anchoring. On top of that, I'm trying to pay you, my camera guy, to be out here, and now I'm probably gonna need to pay you a second day. And then I bring one of my best sponsors out, and he ain't even touching anything, so that's a great representation of what we're trying to do out here. And then my buddy took the day off of work. On top of that, I'm getting sunburned. So yeah, it's a great day. Just got real. For cheesy. Let's try this one, Cody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you be skippy. <laughs> Just freshen up our plugs. The last time today. Uh, it's it's been a long day. Beautiful day. Weather's nice. I've seen a handful of fish caught. The guys on the troll definitely got them better. But we're out here filming an anchor show, so uh, we're sticking sticking to our guns, sticking to the plan. And the tide is just now starting to change right here in the next five, 10 minutes. So we just put on all new baits on the plugs, refreshing up the spinner. It's our last run here, probably for the next hour. It's 5.30, long, long day. But we're gonna see if we can at least get one fish. Right now, we're 0 for four. Those four grabs we have really weren't even that great. So hopefully something happens. Two fish on it. It is now 6.30. We fish for about 10, 11 hours for four grabs, but those four grabs didn't even pull one foot of line. Long, long day. And the frustrating thing is, is that we saw plenty of other fish caught by both guys on anchor and on the troll. Today, we were just that boat, just that boat that got blanked. And we just uh, couldn't figure it out. Honestly, I think we made a couple of mistakes. One, this morning we spent a little bit of time looking back and forth, deciding whether we were gonna come upstream or go downstream. Still think we made the right decision initially to run downstream, but it seemed like the wad of fish that were coming through were upstream of us about three, four miles, and we just turned right when we should turn left. And then when we ended up chasing that cell phone bite, we were just probably about a half hour, hour too late. And once we got up here, when all the boats were hooking up earlier, we only saw maybe one or two other fish get caught for the next three, four hours. So we were just a day late, dollar short, everywhere we went today. But you live and learn. You know, the, the name of the show is Day One Outdoors for a reason. We came out here trying to get it done in one day, and we didn't. We failed today. The goal of this episode was to teach you how to successfully anchor fish. Now, we weren't successful but hopefully you learned enough on how to anchor safely and effectively, either in hog lines or long structure, and how to separate your lines out and how to make sure your gear is fishing correctly. So even though we weren't catching anything today, hopefully when you guys go out there and go anchor fish, you can have a little bit more success than we did here today. We'll see you next week.